Hey, what's going on? It's John, and it's time for JMart Cast for Monday, August 16th, 2021. What's going on? How are ya? <laughs> did that intro sound uh, familiar to you? <laughs> if it did, you probably watch Bill Burr or listen to Bill Burr's Monday Morning Podcast. Not gonna lie, I just totally ripped it off to start my own new podcast, <laughs> the JMart Cast. <laughs> So yeah, welcome. Whoever's listening, I appreciate it. Thank you for spending your time with me. <laughs> I don't know how you came across this, but uh, yeah, let's do some introductions. First of all, nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, my name's John, John Martirosian, but that's not really my name. My real first name is Hovanes. So it's Hovanes Martirosian. You ask Martirosian, what kind of weird last name is that? Well, Armenian last name. So let's do proper inter introductions. I'm just going to tell the story from the beginning, from 1988, the year I was born. The place, like I already said, Armenia. At the time, it was the Soviet Union, the Armenian Republic of the Soviet Union, 1988. Two years later, of course, the Soviet Union uh, broke apart, and Armenia was its own uh, separate state for the first time in a long time, probably like close to 100 years uh, or longer. The problem is Armenia sits in like the middle of Europe and Asia and there's all these giant empires always rolling through and, and yeah, <laughs> always being invaded from uh, both sides of the world. It's, uh, you know, difficult to stay a separate state in a scenario like that. But so what happened, and in the early 90s, Armenia was its own separate state, and I grew up in there in my first eight years. Like, I remember mostly good things, but uh, I do know that in those early times, we had periods of, like, no electricity, no running water, and, you know, it was uh, an uncertain time for sure. So, uh I guess we're experiencing a little bit of that uncertainty right now. But uh, I guess what I can say to that is uh, everything is temporary. This too shall pass. <laughs> and then, so I guess eight years into my life, 1996, I guess, was when we first emigrated from Armenia. Um, we left to go to Ukraine first capital city, Kiev. Spent a little bit of time there, less than a year. I don't remember too much from there. I did, uh, we, I went to a Russian school there, even though it was uh, in Ukraine. I went to a Russian school, so I learned uh, to speak Russian, uh, but I did not speak Ukrainian. I did watch like Ukrainian TV and stuff, but they had a lot of Russian TV. So I think, uh, yeah, I didn't learn any Ukrainian, just uh, learned some Russian. And then that like less than a year later, I guess we moved again and uh, to Russia, so that learning Russian was useful. And then this time we were in Moscow, the capital city there. And we stayed there for quite a bit longer, three, close to three years, I think. Uh, from my time in Russia, what I remember is uh, it was a, really cold, <laughs> and, uh, but also really beautiful in the winter time, of course, because, uh, uh, you know, it's, I guess you just get that like classic white, um, wonderland kind of snow everywhere and then they have those like churches right in the middle of the city with like the round tops that like re look really beautiful and it's just like uh, this big uh, plaza that every like all the pedestrians walk and as a kid you love that because it's you can walk and or run around actually and uh, just look at awesome looking buildings and play with the snow snowball fight or whatever and you know it's, it's okay it's not looked down upon like and it's safe i guess it was safe to do so i, I like that aspect of it um yeah and then uh i guess in 2000 i remember i think it was october of 2000 was uh when we uh moved from moscow we flew to canada we landed at pearson uh, it was actually funny because we were supposed to come before, but there was some problem with our like passports where like they were expired or something, and 
it, it we got delayed by another six to nine months, if I remember right. But we finally got here, and then we uh, were greeted by some friends of people we knew from Russia who happened to uh, live in uh, Brampton, Ontario, of all places. And so that was the uh, place that uh, we moved to. They uh, were gracious hosts and housed us for like two weeks, if perhaps a little bit longer, but it was amazing of them. And then uh, <clears throat> we uh, eventually were able to find a place to move and rent. I think we rented a basement somewhere else in Brampton. And uh, yeah, I mean, and we, I just spent uh, basically the next few years leading up to the end of my high school career in Brampton. In high school is where I met my current wife, Carly, Dr. Carly Willemsma. She was the latest guest on my other uh, podcast, State of Health. Check that one out uh, if you haven't already. But yeah, so lived in Brampton for the next uh, few years from 12 till I guess, was it 18? Yeah, um, uh, till I graduated high school. And then uh, after that, I was accepted at McMaster University in Hamilton to... Uh, go study biochemistry because I wanted to go to medicine. I wanted to be a doctor at that time. And I thought biochemistry was a good, uh, I guess, prerequisite to get into so that it would help me, I guess, prep me to go to medical school. But um, I guess, uh, and then Carly went to McMaster with me. She studied the same thing. And uh, yeah, we had a good time in university, of course, as one does. <laughs> uh, we both got pretty good grades, but Carly's grades were always better than mine because she's super smart. <laughs> and um, yeah, eventually uh, when we graduated, we were both applying. And of course, as fate would have it, she uh, got accepted and I did not, I, uh, which was fine. I was not discouraged, uh, but I... Uh, ended up also applying for uh, a postgraduate in academia for a Master of Science at the University of Toronto, and I did get, get accepted for that. So, and it worked out perfectly because Carly got accepted for medical school at the University of Toronto. So we both moved to Toronto for our uh, postgraduate studies, medical school for her, master's for me. I was uh, studying... Uh, developmental biology of all things. I was in the laboratory of a, a physician who's a nephrologist. And so he was interested in kidney development because a lot of his patients were children who had malformations in kidneys. So we were studying how kidney development is uh, governed by this uh, signaling pathway, which has a funny name. It's the hedgehog signaling pathway. It was originally uh, when discovered it was this spiky protein and these nerd scientists were like, well, Sonic the Hedgehog is uh, spiky. We're going to call this protein uh, Sonic the Hedgehog. So the hedgehog signaling pathway was uh, named. <laughs> and so uh, I studied that and how I was involved in kidney development for uh, nearly three years, I think maybe just shy of three years at the University of Toronto. And then uh, at the end of that, I... Uh, graduated with my master of science and yeah it was a really good experience but unfortunately it didn't really lead me to um going into medical school and then i was kind of uh realized that wasn't really the path i wanted anyway to pursue but there was not many other choices <laughs> either because with a master of science in that you know, hedgehog signaling pathway of kidney development. There aren't many jobs that are hiring for that. <laughs> so I ended up uh, continuing my education with a certificate program in regulatory affairs, which would lead me to work at a pharmaceutical company where I would basically kind of do the necessary like paperwork and uh, yeah, I just, I guess just the paperwork required to make sure that companies stay in line with whatever regulations that the country's regulatory bodies require for those companies to do. So in Canada, that would be Health Canada. Of course, in the U.S., they have the FDA, uh, the EMA, I think, in uh, Europe. Anyway, so I we studied all that, and 
at the end of that, I got a job at Bayer, a big pharmaceutical company that uh, is known for uh, aspirin. They're the makers of aspirin, right? Uh, I believe they're also like the... This is way back before it was illegal, but heroin, they they like the first <laughs> pharma company to market heroin <laughs> too, but they don't like that to be too vocal about that part of their history. But anyway, I worked there for don't remember anymore, probably just like a year and a half, shy of two years, but it was uh, just a contract job that led to, I guess, no, uh, I don't know, follow-up positions. Maybe I didn't make myself stand out in any way, so they didn't want to keep me, I don't know, but led to nowhere. And then I did follow that up with a job at Health Canada (laughs) and uh, I was in the controlled substances division uh, that was interesting. I got to uh, go and um, inspect uh, like uh, medical marijuana uh, production facilities. This was like, what year was this? I guess 2015, maybe 2014, around then. And so, uh, yeah, this was just when the regulations were changing. It was an interesting time. It was right before uh, legalization. But uh, interesting story. Uh, One of the jobs I had to do was uh, go and uh, help with the, I guess, uh, procedure of uh, destroying old uh, marijuana product. I guess the story was that what had happened was one manufacturer had Uh, mistakenly used the pesticide they were not supposed to and this was basically uh, confiscated this the marijuana product which was uh, um, grown with the pesticide but instead of confiscating and taking it away it had simply been kind of like uh, quarantined from whatever other products the facility had they basically had a shelf that had contained all the products and it was just a caution tape wrapped around the whole thing and it had stayed in the vault of the production facility for over a year until they finally got um, a contract with another company that had a license for destruction of controlled substances. And they got the okay from Health Canada to proceed with that. And so what I had to do was go to the facility and unwrap the caution tape and measure all the uh, weight of the uh, now like basically rancid marijuana it had gone like yellow and brown and did not smell good and uh we weighed all that (laughs) and then we uh loaded it up in in a van which was gonna go actually it had to go to quebec of all places because the place they found that had the license the closest one anyway was in quebec and so this van uh got loaded up and had some caution tape around it so that you know, you can open it and remove, I guess, the uh, contraband <laughs> uh, part way through the, uh, you know, ride from the location of the production facility to the destruction location. And so there are going to be our Health Canada colleagues actually waiting at the destruction facility who were going to uh, remeasure what arrived at that location and check it with the data that we provided them in terms of what we uh, collected. <laughs> Anyways, that was uh, quite quite the uh, effort for like some really crappy, like gone bad, like yellow and brown, bad smelling weed that no one would have wanted to steal. <laughs> but yeah, after that, uh, again, the job, it was a contract job that didn't lead to follow up opportunities. I, I don't know, possibly because I didn't shine outshine myself, I guess. But honestly, it was not the right place for me to work. I just uh, working for the government is um, not uh, for everybody. But uh, so I did end up uh, having another job opportunity at a pharmaceutical company. And uh, I did that for about a year. But approaching a year, I was like so fed up with working in a um, office environment and like having to sit all day, not getting a lot of movement. I'm, I've always been such an active person and not getting that like lar- large amount of movement. 
uh, throughout the day was really affecting me and my mood. And then all the commute as well, driving to work was uh, just kind of soul crushing. <laughs> so uh, ended up quitting that job with the support of my, at that time, wife. Uh, I got married in 2014. And then uh, I uh, got a new job as a personal trainer of all things. <laughs> So I, like I said, I've always been active most of my life, most of my life, but uh, like mostly just playing sports and uh, like I did wrestling and you do a lot of training for wrestling, but I, I never like did any weightlifting or anything like that. You just like, you know, practice drills, you lift each other and that's kind of like the weightlifting that you do. So I'd always kind of had like an okay physique, nothing to kind of brag about, but never really like overweight and uh but but and always active but yeah not ever nothing formal and so like i just randomly a friend of mine from my uh, uh master of science program got in touch with me and he was telling me how he had kind of did the, done the same thing and it was like a really good fit and he thought of me and he thought it could have been a good fit as well so i went and talked to him and he just like was able to get me a job at uh, Good Life, which I think is where basically all personal tra trainers start working at as their first job, um, or at least they should. <laughs> but uh, yeah, right at the Good Life at uh, Young and Dundas, um, which was like one of the bigger ones, one of the ones with the largest amount of foot traffic, which was a good thing about it. The unfortunate thing about it was that it was in like the uh, basement, there were no windows, right? It was in the same uh, level as the subway, basically. <laughs> so there was not a lot of uh, sunlight, like I said, which, you know, kind of makes it like a not a great place to, to work, right? Like natural light is so important and not having that. I had to like kind of like at least mul once, but I was, would try multiple times a day to get out of the gym, just go outside, spend five minutes in the sun get a little bit of natural light reset and then get back down and, uh, you know, whatever, go to train the next client. But so, yeah, thus started, I believe it was 2015. Uh, yeah, 2015, maybe early 2016, but I think it was, yeah, maybe early 2016. My uh, personal training career started at Good Life. <laughs> and... Uh, I had basically, in order to get started to be like, to know what to do and how to actually like train people, um, I could have done what's called the uh, CanFit Pro certification. But turns out what this is, is just, it's like a racket that Good Life has where they, uh, uh, you know, they're a gym that, that hires personal trainers. I guess, I don't know, maybe it's not fair to call it a racket, but basically they provide a low level of certification called CanFit Pro uh, that doesn't provide nearly the amount of, uh, I don't know, I guess preparation, at least I thought I would need to be able to like jump into a training session and like go for an hour with somebody, have them have a great workout and like, uh, you know, uh, feel like they were like in good hands. Uh, and I can say that cause I've, I've done it and, uh, because eventually they kind of force you to do it. You don't have to have that specific one when you first get hired there, but eventually you have to have it, you have to get it. So what I did was get another certification that was suggested to me by my friend who, uh, uh got me the job, which was called DTS level one, Darby training systems, level one. Uh, and it was just an awesome uh, five-day training uh, program that goes you goes and teaches you to go how to go through all the basic movements of weight training, like pushing, pulling, squatting, hinging from the hips, uh, all that stuff. How to do it, how to train, how to coach people to do it, and 
it was a great experience because not only like I don't know the the, the teachers there were just awesome and uh, you know they put you in these situations that you would be when you would be training a client anyway so it was perfect to get that experience and then go like basically a week later get started at Good Life and uh, you know I had one client given to me by the managers there right away and you know I started working with the gentleman and he was a pretty novice uh, lifter but so you know new people of course are no don't know how to lift uh, properly innately so more could go, go wrong so but I felt confident training him and it was it was just an awesome experience and I was like oh this is it just clicked right away I wanted to keep doing it I was like oh finally I found a job that connects with me that I can uh, uh, make a real difference in someone's life I can uh, you know and have this like close one-on-one -on -one connection you know just working in the office before it's just such a you know you're staring at a screen most of the time and then when you are talking to people a lot of times it's in this meeting environment which oh my god I just I hated meetings <laughs> just it's, I'm not the office culture type I I'm I guess I've discovered that I'm a gym rat but yeah I spent three years training clients at good life i think it was three years maybe two maybe two and a bit um and um throughout that time i had trained a bunch of different people from different walks of life different age groups uh different uh, physical states different mental states all like yeah it was interesting it was a good time like i don't know i guess you're kind of thrown into the fire where you can get any sort of client and, uh, you know, you have to be ready for, <laughs> for anything. And, you know, some clients, you know, anything you ask them is a big burden and they can't like, nothing can be done. As you say, everything has to be, uh, changed in a way to fit like that person's kind of whatever deficiencies of movement they have, you know, everything needs to be readjusted, regressed and, a lot like a lot of times because I was a novice person and just getting into this field you know I would get stuck because I would regress it to the most basic form that I knew at the time and it would still be too much for some people where uh, you know they would uh, not still not be able to perform the most basic version of what I knew that, that I could ask them to do. And it, is, it, it would just boggle my mind, like, what do I do now? Like, I guess I got to just ditch this and move on to a new thing. It was just a really interesting time, I guess, because, <laughs> you know, if you really take time and kind of think about something, think it through, eventually you'll find, you'll keep finding more and more basic versions that you can ask someone to, to try to do. And I guess it's also having the confidence in, asking them in, in a way that they'll actually say yes to, I suppose. And I guess I did, just didn't have that as a new, you know, start, trainer just starting out. But yeah, it was just, I, I gained a lot of experience. I had some, you know, pretty good clients that were really like good successes. Uh, I'll never forget like my best client, her name was Darlene. It was, she was this 60-year-old, um, she was over 60, I believe. She, was, she must have been 65, 65-year-old. 65 a lady who just had the most amazing transformation where she was quite overweight and through like a year and a half of training with me she I forget the, what the total amount of weight that she lost was but she just like looked so different where like her face was thinner you know that's like usually the telling telltale sign that you've like really lost weight when the face changes right and and yeah people were yeah so like it was amazing to have a client like that, to have a big impact on her like that and like to play a role in someone's life in going through that change and transformation. And I was just hooked. Of course, I also had a lot of like uh, not successful clients because, you know, uh, it's you, you don't always succeed at motivating people to uh, stay consistent, to keep going, to keep trying hard, to not give up, to, yeah, just uh, challenge themselves. And uh you know, there's also like, of course, the financial component every kind of day, even I was going to say every week, but really every day you're kind of just like uh, 
uh, are, you know, looking for new clients and uh, trying to prepare old clients that like whatever uh, package a number of sessions that they've purchased, it's coming near the end. So they need to think about, you know, uh, whether they want to continue and get more sessions and all this, the financial part of it that is, uh, you know, probably the most difficult part of uh, like a managing the business as a starting out trainer, you know, you're you're eager to uh, learn about training and teach it to other people and share your knowledge and help them work towards their goals. But you, you struggle with uh, uh, kind of asking for the equivalent value back for, uh, for the service you're providing. I don't know. Yeah, I guess it, it's hard for some people, not for everybody. I mean, there's, I remember a dude at, at uh, Good Life who was like the best at, kind of just poker facing where poke, maybe poker facing is not even the right way to uh, uh, describe it because he, I guess what he, he, he just came off very confident where he, he would make the uh, potential, you know, uh, client come and make them believe that this uh, training package was the, uh, like the missing link between him reaching the goals that he had in his mind. Uh, and so, it, I don't know, it just worked really well for, for him to be able to like connect that piece in a lot of people's minds and make them commit. And, uh, you know, not saying he manipulated people in a negative way. I think uh, he just made them realize something that was positive, most likely, for them in the long run. Uh, in a confident manner and you know not everybody just has that innately you definitely have to practice it of course and I over time I did get it better and better at it as well uh, developing that confidence and kind of like that uh, almost like I don't give a fuck attitude one way or another whether you want to continue or not it's not necessarily that but like it's kind of similar I don't know a better way to describe it but yeah uh, but it definitely took time and then uh so yeah that was the time in good life but after about like I said two and a half to three years I was uh I guess ready to move on from there and I ended up uh finding I started looking for jobs at other gyms applied to a couple of place, places and ended up kind of getting an interview at this little boutique gym uh, called KX Yorkville and I was, uh, I went and checked out the gym and it was like this really cool little boutique place where it was just a personal training studio where the type of gym where it didn't even have a membership for people to just go in and train on their own. It was just, you were committed to working one-on-one -on -one with somebody and uh, you go there to do that with that with the trainer so it's an interesting place really neat to come across a place like that because uh you can kind of get a really good look at the inner workings of how to run a business which was really uh, helpful to see that to kind of see for myself is is this something that i could see myself doing in the future yeah, i don't know if i have an answer for that right now but definitely it was very informative and i really liked working there I had an awesome boss who was very uh uh, kind of fair and and kind of actually cared about uh, you know uh, just my success and me wanting to work there and be happy about working there and that was in contrast to what I experienced at Good Life. <laughs> Good Life actually once thing I did, forgot to mention was just as I started working there, it was, uh, they had had a vote or they had a vote after I started working there, uh, what, on whether they were going to unionize or not the, uh, trainers, the personal trainers. And so, uh, the vote went through, uh, and they did unionize. And then, so right away I was like kind of thrown into this, like, you know, trainers versus managers struggle, I guess you could call it. <laughs> and so, of course, like, it's just, you know, it, it's going to lead to a lot of tension between uh, managers and employees like that. So 
there's definitely a lot of that happening in good life. Uh, and it was just a breath of fresh air to move to this like small boutique gym where you get to work with really uh, committed clients and have a boss who's uh, really uh, invested in your uh, wanting to be there and be happy and successful. And then uh, I guess that lasted for a little while, about a year and probably close to a year and a half, close to two years, at which point I had my son, first son. He was born in 2019, May 11th, 2019. And uh, yeah, one of the happiest days of my life, of course, <laughs> obligatory. <laughs> but uh, I, I think I ended up uh, taking, uh, was it two weeks off, maybe a little longer, and then went back to work at like, fewer kind of uh at a lighter schedule basically let's say but i was just like missing my son and didn't last too long i think i ended up going back for only a month maybe two months and then i talked to my uh, uh manager like the owner of the gym and i he was so nice he to totally understood and he just was like go be a dad it's uh i totally understand like you know I, I know you're, <laughs> you do what you want to do. And so that's, it was, it was amazing just to like one of the best kind of like work experiences I've ever had, a uh, job experience I've ever had where like, I uh, actually felt sad leaving, leaving there on my last day. Like we had a nice little uh, dinner too that the uh, guys took me out to. They uh, got a little gift for, for my son Bennett too. And yeah, it was just a very uh, touching thing, I guess. Really enjoyed that. All right, and I guess that brings me to, like following that, I started uh, uh, training clients from, from my place because at that point, uh, my wife and I had purchased a home, uh, had just purchased a home, and I basically set up a training studio in the basement I have all sorts of uh, training equipment down there. I've got a squat rack, barbell, of course, all the weights for the barbells. I've got a bunch of specialty uh, bells as well, like a safety squat bar. I've got a trap bar, uh, a Swiss bar. <laughs> I've got adjustable dumbbells, kettlebells, uh, gymnastic rings, uh, resistance bands, you name it. I've got it. <laughs> TRX, forgot that one. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I was training clients from the base from the basement studio for a while, and then of course, brings us to almost like present day, I guess, fateful March 2020, I guess, <laughs> was when uh, uh, I guess the lockdowns, the first set of kind of quarantines, I guess, happened with uh, the pandemic kind of becoming official, I guess. we. I guess we knew like coronavirus was spreading in China for a while before that, but we thought potentially it wasn't gonna <laughs> escape. And uh, so ever since, uh, ever since then, I guess, uh, you know, things have changed, of course. Uh, the uh, gym businesses have suffered greatly, as many of you know. <laughs> and uh, of course, it's, Similarly, for myself, uh, I stopped uh, training clients in person. Uh, I did continue to have uh, clients that I trained over Zoom, which was good, and that lasted for some time. But of course, uh, uh, just Zoom's not the most effective way of training clients, and I don't know. I just no one. You know, I, I guess I keep saying no one becomes a trainer to. Tra train people over zoom right you want that one-on-one -on -one connection and uh so you know over time you know we clients just uh, no longer wanted to continue training on zoom which i understood and i kind of felt the same way in some of the like in in some ways you know of course i would love to continue to train people over zoom but you know i i totally understand <laughs> not wanting to continue that or if you know, somebody finds another person who's doing a more enthusiastic job on Zoom. I totally get that, and I support them <laughs> wanting to do that over with me. 
Although I did in this time take the opportunity and the initiative to start this new thing that I, you know, just trying to create in a more of an online kind of presence with my knowledge of health and fitness. So I did start the State of Health podcast. If anybody else has listened to episodes of that, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, I really do. Um, and so, yeah, I've been uh, just trying to share what I've learned in the last, well, since like I've been learning, which is basically my whole life, of course. But, uh, you know, everything's been set up for me to kind of like, I've always wanted to be involved in health, right? I wanted to be a doctor. Maybe I didn't. Yeah, I wanted to be a doctor, let's say. And I, you know, applied to medical school. And then, and of course, I was maybe a disillusioned with that dream and changed my mind. But I didn't know what else I wanted to do. But as soon as I came across another thing relating to health, and I was training people, and like, it was such a, it ignited a fire in me. And I like, and you know, all everything I've learned up to this point has kind of been supportive of, of me kind of now being good at this because with the kind of bachelor of science in molecular biology I have a pretty good understanding of kind of how the human body from a biochemical level, how that functions. I have really have a good lens for that. And then with the uh, academia, the time I spent in academia earning my master of science, that was really good and really useful kind of for now because a lot of the critical thinking skills I learned as what it takes to be a real scientist, right? To earn the master of science is what I use now when I'm like learning new things, when I'm reading journal articles and papers and I'm reading results and methods. I have like a lot of these like carryover skills that help me decide what to judge for myself, whether like something makes sense or not, whether, uh, you know, if, uh, everything's been accounted for all the variables it's it's i'm absolutely grateful for the time i spent in academia earning my master of science even though it didn't lead me to you know having a career and anything kind of like close to that the skills i learned through that have been amazing in kind of carrying me forward and um yeah being just like i said being good at what i do now and like as i'm learning more about the human body and physiology and like the, uh, there's so much information out there, right? You have to know how to sift through all that. And luckily with that training that I have through uh, the time I spent at the University of Toronto, I, I feel confident in my ability to, you know, uh, read, read some, uh, you know, a piece of evidence and, uh, you know, be able to ascertain whether, uh, how much weight I can put behind it. And at the same time, though, I, I also know that the more <laughs> I learn and the more I uh, kind of uh, think I know about things, I have to. I also have like a you can think of it like, like as a greater 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 surface of uh, things that I don't know as well. So it's like that classic paradox of the more you know, the more you don't know. So the more I know, I'm the more I'm also uh, in not like not confident in <laughs> what I think I know, <laughs> if that makes any sense. <laughs> but uh yeah i don't know where i was going with that <laughs> all right i was just looking taking a look at, at the recording here we're at 45 minutes i'm hoping to extend this to close to an hour so i don't know if i can go for another 15 minutes but i will try this is a classic bill burr move to like mention the time and be like i don't know if i'm gonna make it but i'm gonna plow on ahead <laughs> so yeah and so yeah, so I've been doing my State of Health podcast for the last nine months, I guess, because I'm, I'm, I'm on episode nine now, and I've been trying to do it at a frequency of one episode per month. I did kind of, uh, I was late on the last episode, actually, that, that one I skipped a month, so maybe 10 months it's been. But yeah, it's been really cool to put that out there and uh, have people listen. There's not a lot of like <laughs> views and, you know, uh, counts uh, in terms of uh, play counts but uh whoever's listening i do appreciate it a lot thank you very much and uh and the quality is going to keep getting better that's my hope i'm gonna keep uh going one percent better per episode so in a hundred episodes it should be good <laughs> we're at nine now so i got uh, 91 to go struggle that math there for a second 
so uh yeah and um and yeah and so i developed this uh, in addition so that with covid i guess coming on and people kind of staying at home and being less active and stuff i developed this uh training program which i ended up calling body basics and um it's free and it's available if anyone's interested you can go to subscribepage.com slash body basics and uh you can sign up and get it uh through an email format and uh yeah, it's just a basically a free body weight training program. You don't need any equipment, not even a pull up bar. All you need is basic stuff that anyone's got at home, like you know, chairs, uh, broomsticks, that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, it's just what I think is the most important kind of movements for in body weight training. And uh, I have little explanations in like the emails that I sent, so everyone check it out if you're interested. I did run like a bit of, I guess a beta test initially with my friends and uh, family. Uh, initially, I called it uh, JOMC, which was uh, JMART's online movement collective. <laughs> and so I had like eight to 10 people initially, I think, who were part of that, who did all 16 training sessions that make up the Body Basics training program. And I mostly received positive feedback from it. So I decided to just put it out there as like a free thing for people to get. And then it's basically my way of collecting um, email addresses so that like I can, I, I basically using that, I started a newsletter. So uh, I, uh, it's not quite once a week. <laughs> it's basically like at least once a month, but uh, I send out emails with like, cool, interesting things related to health and fitness that I've been reading, watching, and um, kind of learning about. So yeah, if you're interested in that, like I said, just get the uh, free Body Basics training program. And so I've been enjoying doing that and just basically, like I said, putting more content of what I've been learning for the past you know, four or five years out there to help as many people as I can because like I said, it's a passion of mine it's a little bit more difficult to do that in person now. So trying to find different ways of uh, getting the message out there and uh, helping people get healthy, right? Uh, that's what it's all about, all about uh, especially these days, of course. Uh, uh, health is the number one topic in people's minds in one way or another. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't want to get into that too much. <laughs> Such a divisive topic c19 as they call it <laughs> but um 50 minutes 50 minutes can i make it another 10 minutes i hope so I, let's see what we can do uh, i had a few list of topics that i wanted to talk about so yeah there you know there there's the answer to the question for who is j mart and there's a little bit of sprinklings of for why maybe you should listen to me i guess because um you know, as you can see, I have this, I guess, potentially a broad perspective, having lived in uh, four different countries for at least six months, you could say. <laughs> and, um, and uh, yeah, being in the East and the West, having some, you know, academic training with the uh, Master of Science, having some real world experience like training people and having them helping them succeed in terms of reaching their goals and all that but yeah it's up to you and i've also got to be interesting and entertaining to listen to so you know this is the first episode so i'm you know gonna get better than this but hopefully this is a good enough to start out with <laughs> yeah so um i guess here what, what are the things that i wanted to talk about uh, how to be healthy was one of the things, I guess. Yeah, maybe I'll do a quick rundown of that, like how to be healthy. I guess I, I break down how to be healthy into, um, I guess, recovery, which the main main aspect of recovery is, of course, sleep. Make sure you get enough sleep. If you're getting enough adequate sleep, that can help restore a lot of the maladies your body feels. And then um, that's kind of like the... I guess the foundation of health and then the pillars of health you could say are strength, um, flexibility, I guess you can, yeah, sure, flexibility, uh, nutrition, what you're eating, 
um, making sure, you know, you're eating healthy foods, minimizing junk foods, um, you know, getting out in nature and getting some sunshine, you know, that'll help with vitamin D, but there's other, other benefits to getting sunshine as well. And then I guess having a good community, healthy, a community that like loves you and you feel like you belong in. That's one that people don't mention a lot, but I think it's a very important one. Um, so yeah, if you can do those things, getting, get adequate sleep, have a good movement practice. So you're active physically, uh, you know, so that you're strong and flexible, you get good nutrition taken care of, um, get outside, get some sun and spend time with friends and family. Uh, if you can check mark all those boxes, that can be a solid foundation of health, I think. Um, <laughs> I had this funny thing that I thought of. Uh, <laughs> facts of life. Just sh things that like, just because you're alive, alive they, they, they happen. <laughs> Fact, hashtag facts of life. Uh, one I thought of, just autocorrect will only ruin like your most important messages. The stupid ones that if it were to autocorrect and be funny, like, and everyone would get a laugh, that never happens. It's just like the serious ones where it autocorrects into uh, just like making it super embarrassing or just nonsensical. Those are the most, that's when autocorrect kicks in. <laughs> Hashtag facts of life. <laughs> oh yeah. And then I guess I'll finish today's episode maybe with a, with a, a story that, uh, happened on my uh, Instagram account. So anyone interested, check out my Instagram at jmartfit, J-M-A-R-T-F-I-T. Uh, and so, yeah, what happened was I, uh, in my stories, I reposted this, um, I repost reposted this uh, graphic from um, Rob Wolf about uh, methane claims and how like, basically the title of the, of the post is methane claims against cattle are overblown. And then it shows this uh, bar graph of like greenhouse gas emissions by sector. And then in text it says, according to the EPA, all livestock only represent 3.9% of US greenhouse gas emissions, which is far lower than the 18 to 51% range many plant-based advocates report. The largest source of greenhouse gas emission in the U.S. comes from energy and transportation. Yeah, so like uh, within like the livestock, cattle itself or beef itself is only 2% of the total U.S. greenhouse gas emission. And then so what had happened was that somebody, um, I reposted that on uh, my Instagram stories. And what happened is somebody uh, responded back to me and they said, uh, quote, uh, I think you're being bamboozled here. The headline talks about methane, but looks like the figure shows volume of all greenhouse gas and misses how methane is way more potent than carbon dioxide. So yeah, so I read that and it was, I just wanted to recheck what he was talking about. So uh, first of all, bamboozled. <laughs> I was bamboozled reading bamboozled. <laughs> uh, not looking at the graph of <laughs> the infographic anyway. <laughs> But uh, yeah, but he, he was right in a way that the, the graph was talking about all greenhouse gas emissions. And then the title was saying that the methane emission from cattle itself is overblown. And then he was making the case, well, methane is way more potent than carbon dioxide. First of all, way more potent than as what? I think he means way more potent as a greenhouse gas. Okay, that's true. But, so my response was, <laughs> I'll read it out. Uh, I think, <laughs> I was, just the bamboozled thing really got me. So I was like, <laughs> I'm going to respond with bamboozled because like I've never heard it be used in like text or I think the only time I've heard bamboozled is like on on Friends, if I remember correctly. Like that was like the uh, the show that Joey was was on, bamboozled. Somebody correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I responded, maybe I was a little snarky by saying bamboozled, but this is what I said. I said, I think most people are being bamboozled by the methane is a more potent greenhouse gas factoid. Yes, that's true, but you have to look at the full life cycle of carbon. Half-life for carbon dioxide gas is over a thousand years compared to 10 years for methane. 
Not to mention that regular biogenic emission of methane is part of the normal carbon life cycle, unlike carbon dioxide emission from fossil fuels that releases trapped carbon, which hadn't been part of the carbon cycle for millennia. And then I told him to check out the book Sacred Cow if he's interested to learn more. Anyway, I hope I wasn't too strong in saying that back to him. But uh, yeah, it's interesting how, I don't know, he seemed like he had a pretty strong opinion on that. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I guess maybe I'm interpreting that just by that bamboozled. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, if you have a strong opinion on something, hopefully you've researched it a little bit more to have a like a strong you know argument behind uh, your opinion. And I guess uh, yeah. I'll leave it at that. I'm, I don't know. I'm at 59 minutes here. I just got to go for another minute. <laughs> and I'm good. Classic Bill Burr style. Just like kill the last minute until it's over. Thanks everybody for listening. This has been awesome. Just trying to do this. I didn't think I'd be able to. I thought I'd totally like suck at this. And uh, I probably did suck to be honest. But, you know, I didn't. I, I thought I'd have a lot more dead air than I think I did. I'll definitely listen back to this and try to edit a little bit of the, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, ums, I guess, that I that I say. Hopefully, I don't, didn't say too many. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's been interesting to try this out. I always, like, listen to Bill Burr and thought, like, like it's interesting how he does it, right? Just talking to yourself into a microphone. Uh, it's like, you know, it's like a muscle to be able to do it well and to still make sense and sound interesting, entertaining, make jokes, you know, and, you know, I always thought it'd be really, and it is really difficult and I'm, you know, I'm just making shit up as I'm, <laughs> as I'm saying this, but yeah, it's been fun to try it out and, uh, you know, it wasn't as bad as I thought it'd be, but it was still pretty hard and, but fun to do and thanks everyone for listening. I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.